recorded. I think it's amazing this incubator concept that all of you are participating in and helping to structure. Um, I also know it's not easy. You know, you're holding two uh, or a couple of diverse perspectives uh, in this sort of project. So I just want to hats off to anybody who's helping to organize this as well as participate in it. Um, so I'll just get into this presentation I have. Um, okay, so I'm going to share my screen. Uh, Somi, I think you have to enable participant sharing. So it says host has disabled participant screen sharing. You should be able to now. Okay. All right. So here it is. Everybody can see the screen. Okay. Yes. Yes. All right. Okay. All right. So it's 510. Um, ideal to real integral projects in the material world. Uh, I think what I was inspired to do here was um, to help, in a sense, bring a bit of that evil structure that we hate about the business world or maybe don't understand and how that can be of value uh, in some ways to different people's projects. You know, um, Even if you're doing something like writing a book or something more uh, like building a community, I, I think business approach is just a way to collaborate, right? So I, I think that's what inspired the start of this presentation. Um, a bit about myself, yeah, I'm, I grew up in India and Singapore. I, I have a business degree from NYU Stern. So I, I really had a chance to see like Wall Street culture firsthand. I rejected that, moved to villages in South India in the middle of nowhere to help do social enterprise. And then after that, I was consulting for a lot of different startups and small, medium-sized businesses on mostly marketing and branding all over the world. I was the director of marketing for a tech company here in Silicon Valley. I'm a painter with collectors uh, in different countries as well. So I, you know, I think moving to art was very helpful for me to soften uh, my sort of interest in commerce. And I spent seven years in PCC getting my master's while I was doing a lot of other stuff on the side. Uh, this is the third project I'm founding, um, which is Numinous Realm. I'll talk about it in a moment. And I would just say, like, I have started multiple things. I see it all as practice. None of them was what you would call an exit in terms of, you know, it was the company was sold to somebody else or it's a large company that is just existing today. Um, and I would say my growth edge, even though I have a business degree, is like commercial clarity because I rejected the world of finance during the Great Recession. And so that is my challenge, ironically enough, is to really find a way to forgive and integrate uh, money and commerce. And that's part of where I would say a lot of my personal exploration comes from and in this presentation. Numinous Realm, just to give a sense, like I'm working on what I consider an integral project today. Uh, it's building on the research of CIIS professors in the field of transpersonal psychology. So it's at this intersection of like astrology uh, and maybe something like fashion uh, is an area that we're looking into. And then clearly wanting to commercialize that. So it's not going to be a book. It's not going to be a nonprofit. I'm interested in it being a business because I feel like that is what will allow it to self-sustain, even if you know I'm not around or something like that. And tech is a small part of what we do at the moment as well. Uh, this project has been through three major pivots. It was founded in 2015 uh, or 2016, I forget now, but it's been quite a few years, quite a few pivots. I, I did apply to Y Combinator, which is a very tech sort of uh, accelerator uh, w where I was rejected from that. I mean, many people apply many times. I applied once. And then I was incubated at WeWork Labs in 2019. And it's been really hard. It's been really great. So I think that's something that everybody here who's working on the integral project can relate to. So I'm going to start with this ideal, right? What is the ideal, right? If we're going from ideal to real, I guess the ideal section here is a bit more on the philosophical considerations that I'd like to just open up. So firstly, what is integral, right? We're talking about integral impact, integral projects. What is integral? Is it theory, right? We have all this uh, very complex looking theory uh, from Wilbur, from Aurobindo, from Gebser, the Groff, Campbell, uh, Tarnas, right? Um, there's so many theories and I do not want to uh, mitigate the, the value of these theories by, you know, by just putting them all up on a slide and saying, look at all these theories. I'm not trying to minimize them, but I'm just asking, like, is that it? Is the theory it? Or I would say many of these 
theorists would even indicate that the theory points to a larger reality beyond it. Uh, or is integral protest, right? Does it mean that you're integral because you're protesting uh, you know, injustices of, of modernity? Is that what makes somebody integral, right? Just because they're against the mainstream or is it something different? Or is it Burning Man, right? Because you've been to Burning Man, are you suddenly integral? You, you know, you, you've worn cool costumes in the desert. So suddenly you're like this very integral being. Is that what it is or is it something else, right? Or is it, or is it even going to Mars? Like, do you have to accept the fact that, yeah, we're going to Mars and there's this very evolutionary perspective? Um, so I would just like to ask uh, one person to popcorn out, uh, you know, with no pressure, just very casually, like what is integral to you? Um, so I'm going to call on somebody. I'm going to call on Sarah. If you can just, you know, casually, just no pressure, just what is integral to you? If you could just share a few, a few thoughts. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, for me, I, I coming into integral, um, I learned about it first through Ken Wilber's work. And now I'm looking at Gebser and uh, Coombs and or Sri Aurobindo. So for me, integral has to do with um, the like the aqual framework. So the all quadrants, all lines, level stages. There's a developmental component to uh, integral. There's a uh, include and transcend kind of element. But I think when I think about it in terms of um, education and integral education, it takes into account different developmental stages of humans and it takes into account inner and uh, like subjective and objective realities. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much. So I'm just going to present an idea. Okay. This is just my stand. Just some ideas I just want to share to like stir the pot. Okay. Um, here's my sense is that integral is a feeling, right? So when we're talking about an integral era to come, I think the intellect can hold part of it, but I personally have connected it to the most when I have a feeling, it's like when I'm walking down the street and I see a person and I imagine their story and I consider the larger field of which we are all a part. So it, it's almost like a feeling. Um, I'm just presenting this idea out there. Other points that I found helpful is that it's holding diverse viewpoints with acceptance. So looking at somebody who is, you know, a hardcore techno capitalist destroying the rainforest, and then also looking at somebody who's, you know, the same person who's standing, chained themselves to the tree, accepting both of those as part of this divine play, right? So seeing creativity as divine in origin. So not judging any part of creation or reality because it's like, who am I to judge it? Um, while at the same time acknowledging my own position on an issue. So I think it's okay that let's say for me, I believe in preserving rainforest as much as possible. I am okay to accept that. And I'm unafraid to engage reality to make my vision real, right? So even though I'm accepting that somebody else is part of the cosmic creation and it's all creative, I'm okay that I too am part of that. And I have a viewpoint that I'm unafraid to act upon even though I am embracing all of creation, all right? Um, so here's the next section is who are we? Okay, so I did ask uh, the team to, you know, get a sense of what sorts of projects are people working on. So here's some of the feedback that came in uh, on, you know, what are people doing in this incubator? So one is online, online programs, as well as one-on-one -on -one mentoring to support support folks in reconnecting with their inner guidance. Another was a creative coaching business. Another was a spiritual safe haven. Another was psychological content and social platform to augment psychotherapy. Another one was educational services to provide online classes in motherhood studies. So as I considered this and just sort of felt into them, it seemed like Really, it came down to these sorts of words. This was the feeling I was getting from the community that it's about guiding, about nurturing, about healing, supporting, building community. I think, you know, I'm going out on a limb here, but many of us come to uh, CIIS with a sense of, uh, with a challenging experience to the mainstream. And so we found something at CIIS. We want to turn around and we want to share it with people. 
Uh, and when asked, what is your obstacle? People saying marketing and business plan, legal NDA, protecting self and others, uh, getting differentiator, uh, visibility and sales funnel. And you know, some people had no obstacles. But if I simplify this, it really seemed to me like it comes down to these very dry sort of concepts which exist in the world, which is like a marketing plan, legal documents, business strategy, sales plan, all these corporations which we, which we love or we dislike, many of them, all of them are in some ways operating and developing these kinds of plans. So there's no reason why integral projects cannot do the same. So I'm, uh, here's another exercise. I'm gonna call on Colleen if that's okay with you, to ask you uh, if, if you are doing a project at the moment, that what is the gift you are trying to share and what is one of the obstacles standing in your way? And if you're not doing a project, you can just speak more generally. I, I am doing a project. Uh, it's a nonprofit and it's an education-based nonprofit to provide education on Title IX, so um, sex, sex discrimination, and then also any other type of discrimination or harassment trainings and, and prevention and policy work. Um, so that would be the gift. And then my obstacle is funding. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Colleen. Um, so I'm gonna present this idea that your gift is the obstacle. Uh, I'm just trying to put these two on equal footing, right? Oftentimes it can feel like I have this gift that I want to bring to the world. Like I want, I want to be a, a musician, but the world sucks. You know, nobody is going to hire me. Nobody likes my music. So I want to put these both on equal footing by reciting this almost, it's like a poem, right? It's like your gift is a karmic obligation, right? You're born here with a certain set of experiences and a certain person you are. And so you have this gift you want to bring. But who knows where this gift comes from? It's a mystery, right? Rooted deep into the cosmos, like the same thing which created the stars, created you, created you know, us. And by embracing this gift, it can open up a fulfilling life that we don't quite know. And, and Campbell talks about following your bliss. It's, it's like this hidden path that you just intuitively are following. But I, I want to put our obstacle as the same thing it's a karmic obligation it's 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 in our way it's in our path it is it is what our gift is asking us to become or, or to absorb so that the gift can bloom so the obstacle is as much a karmic cosmic mystery as the gift is and you know unpacking this obstacle or, or negotiating with it dealing with it is as much a path to a fulfilling life okay so now we talk about morality. I just thought this was helpful. Uh, it's something I've encountered often in very progressive side of CIIS where all of business sometimes is painted as this negative thing. So I just wanna soften this question, just wanna open it up a little bit, okay? So here's one claim, money is the root of all evil, right? And this is, I'm putting this in a somewhat sarcastic way because I cannot imagine that this woman here who's at the grocery store, who's buying what looks to be coffee is because she's using money or has money is just this absolutely evil person, right? So is it true that money is the root of all evil or is it, is it something different than that? Here's another one. Politics is the root of all evil, right? And many times the hypercapitalists will, will hold this view that government sucks, politics gets in the way, it's a bunch of bureaucrats. But looking at this politician here who I believe is uh, mayor of San Francisco or, or was at some point, like she cares about certain issues. She's trying to make certain changes in her community. She's elected by a certain constituency. Is she really the root of all evil or is she just a committed leader who's trying to make a certain kind of change in the world? Another is greed is the root of all evil. And here we have a kid who's eating M&Ms and we all know that we have inner child inside of us. In some ways it never goes away. So if somebody you know, wanted to buy 10 purses instead of just one, or somebody just loves to eat at really nice restaurants. And again, those restaurants are what? Those are chefs who have spent years honing their craft, very creative, right? Just because they like to engage at a certain volume, does that suddenly make them the most evil, like devil reincarnate? I, I don't know. I'm just asking the question. And then desire is the root of all evil, right? So surely th this couple sitting here, you know, on a bench in a park, like surely this is the devil come to life, right? Like if we have desires, if, if somebody wanted to have a house near the beach 
or if somebody wanted to go on a vacation to Europe, like, does that suddenly make them so evil, right? So I, I would just want to soften this point of like money, politics, greed, desire. I think from a certain Christian perspective, I think taken to an extreme, they become evil. But I think it's, it's hard to apply some technical point where suddenly it becomes evil, right? Um, and I'm going to bring up this idea which exists in certain gender studies uh, and psychotherapy, this idea of a quote unquote Madonna whore complex. So in you know a heteronormative sense, this, there is this sense that female sexuality, and I, and I believe we could open this up to sexuality in general, or uh, well, if I just get right to it, it's this sense that uh, it's, it's hard for women in some situations in heteronormative situations to be perceived as good and sexual, right? Either they are seen as objects of just pure desire and in a very objectified and something you just desirable. But if you're looking for something more serious and long-term, then you have to be this pure being who's not real even, right? And so I'm bringing up this idea to, and it's a sense of splitting, right? And I think many women have fought to reclaim uh, the, 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 the integral beings that they are, right? Very capable of uh, being caring and nurturing and, and worthy of uh, respect while also being sexual and, you know, have desires of their own, right? So I'm bringing up this, this concept from psychology um, towards money, right? And many times I see people who are like, money is so bad, it's the worst thing ever. Um, but, you know, it's, but if, if they're buying like, you know, like a, a drone or they're buying an iPhone, they love it. But if somebody else is buying a car, they hate it, okay? So I'm just bringing up the sense of intense splitting that money itself is, it, it, can we approach it in a way that's just neutral? It just is an integral reality. It's not one or the other, okay? So uh, here's a question I would like to ask Lucien, if that's okay with you. In your view, if you could just share your thought, like what is the root of all evil? I knew you were gonna follow me for this. Um, terribly difficult question. My intuition is, is ignorance is the root of all evil um, because to me, evil is kind of a cosmic constitution that is really embedded in our nature reality, our matter reality. And it just, it just sort of is the occurrence of not being at oneness. It's sort of like what you're talking about with this divide, like objecthood in matter is sort of a negation of oneness. And that multiplicity um, sort of is difficult to work with as spiritual beings. So that sort of becomes an evil negotiation of discovering something that's really not evil at all. It's kind of very esoteric, but that's really the only evil thing I think is real. Yeah, that, that's really good. That's a, a great attempt at a very tough, <laughs> one of the toughest questions. Thank you. Um, so I'm gonna present this idea that evil is multivalent. Okay, so in modernity, if people tracking evolution of consciousness in modernity, which is, a, which is seen as a phase of consciousness, evil was seen as very real and objective. So like Christianity is saying that this is evil, that is not evil, okay? And then we come to post-modernity, which was very subjective. It was, uh, in a sense, we, we suddenly realized that there's so many opinions out there. So everything is subjective. And so this, you know, there is no up, there is no down. It's very hard to find anything that's real. So anything was accepted under the guise of this relativism, right? And I'm gonna present just the thought or the expl exploration that within the integral paradigm, and this is taking a page out of archetypal uh, cosmology and archetypal psychology that evil is real and it is subjective at the same time, right? It, it, is, uh, it is what we call multivalent, right? So the same occurrence could for one person the evil for the other person, the exact same thing which happened uh, could be uh, not evil, but the concept of evil is very much real. It's not just a fabrication. It is a, it is part of the cosmos, right? So I'm saying that 
authenticity and intuition is your coordinate in space time. So it's important to have a sense of what is your authentic reality, right? If everybody around you is saying that, you know, Republicans suck, but you suddenly start to feel like, you know, I believe in some conservative ideas. So you need to, I think, have a sense or vice versa, like you're raised in a very conservative family, but you suddenly start believing in liberal ideas. I think connecting to your intuition is very important. Um, evil is not rooted in matter itself, right? But occurs at the intersection of spirit and matter. Um, so many times in spiritual communities, anything relating to the flesh, you know, is, is just seen as something worth transcending beyond. Um, you know, sometimes material things are seen as just, we don't need them. You know, monks reject everything and just meditate. Um, but I think in an integral sense, like holding the human experience, I'm just presenting this idea that it is not just in matter, but it's at this intersection, right? So it's, it's your context helps guide your relationship to this cosmic reality. So it is a real thing. Uh, but where you are situated, what your goals are, what your beliefs are, that is what uh, opens up the sense of evil. So if, if so, hopefully this opens it up from being so flat as like money is evil to just being a bit looser and, and allowing for personal agency and experiences of life to come into it. So now we get to the section called real. Okay, um, this is the second half of the presentation which is gonna focus a little bit more on the actual uh, skills required. And I think I can take a pause at this moment just to ask uh, if anybody would like to raise any questions before we head on to the next section or would like to share anything with the rest of the group. Uh, yes, uh, Lucien. Yeah, I just, um, I wanted to really capitalize real quickly on this intuition element. Um, I think it's so important to value intuition because, I mean, in, in Steiner's philosophy, intuition is actually spirit and spirit is individuality and individuality is self. So I think that you're like, by bringing this intuitive element into real world solutions is actually um, the consequence of that is looking at the individual, not as a um, statistic, but as a real occurrence in reality that has an agency and a meaning that's cosmic and not just sort of transactional. Um, so just to emphasize that. Yeah, thank you, Lucien. It, it makes me think of this uh, sense that like you are the cosmos, which is I think a, a line that Rick wrote somewhere that you are the cosmos, right? And it's uh, we hear this in our communities that you are a cosmic being. And it's that careful balance of not getting too inflated, like saying, I am the cosmos, I can do whatever I want. But at the same time, realizing that you are part of the same processes that have given rise to this amazing world and as is your intuition and it makes me think of Chris Bache as well who is a transpersonal thinker who was also a professor uh, on religious studies who would just started to explore radical intuition where he had a certain idea come up and then he would bring it up in the class and it would unlock a key in some of his students that his intellect alone couldn't have done and so really trusting that there are deeper fields that we are tapping into even if it's a bit scary sometimes um, Sarah, please. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, and wondering what you would have to say or anyone, like how these, these characteristics, I love the way you talk about integral as a feeling and that like, so that um, includes the, like out of the head, the mind body connection. And I'm thinking about how this relates to say a, a, an incubator and how um, how we consciously come into a like a, a process considering the mind body connection and if we're thinking about uh, criteria or characteristics I don't have an answer I don't know if it's really a question either but I'm just wondering how these things like um, the intersection of spirit and matter 
the role of uh, like the conversation around agency and intuition and authenticity and the the notion of things being um, like accounting for multi multivalence. Uh, they just seem like very that they're 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 pieces of this question of you know what is the what is an integral impact or what is integral in a business context i don't have really a question i don't think but i'm what that's what i'm wondering about Up here was very, very still for a moment. So I think, oh, he's dropped off. Just hated that question so much. He had to leave. I have, um, to mutize him with what Lucien was saying, uh, the sense of the intuition. Um, I've been wondering about the intuition recently a lot in the sense that it seems to be this function space somewhere in the self where by whatever means, you know, um, it's, it's almost like experimentation. Like the self seems to experiment okay, in certain okay. ways with functions. And then once it comes up with viable functions, descriptions of the world that they can then enter or combinations of functions that they can then enter our perception and become part of our world model. But we don't have any conscious control over this intuition space, it seems. We can just sort of like tune in and listen or become quiet, right? Um, and when it comes to agency, it seems that we misinterpret part of ourselves, the, the language, the conscious language part as the agent. But I think that's not the agent. That is just sort of the byproduct of the actual agent. And the agent is driven much more by intuition and the incentives. So that we're gonna do things that often we think we're doing intentionally and consciously, but most likely we're doing them because our body needs to you know, manage its energy budget somehow. and fix uh, some needs or motivations in some way, like uh, connecting with other humans, you know, having food in the body, having sex, sleeping, all of these things that in combination in certain variations drive a lot of our behavior. And I don't think it's mechanical in that sense. It's just that the thing that we usually identify as the self, I think that has m either none or much less agency than we ascribe to it so that, um, and, and this is where I'm starting to get confused because then if I say you can change yourself in the future by changing how you shift your focus, what is that which changes the focus? And, and what is the impetus for changing your focus? Because you, you seem to be able to create agency by being more mindful and um, not trying to consciously explain something but by making space for your inner abilities to explain that which presents itself to your sense perception. At least that's where I'm currently at. I don't know if that's helpful in any way. Um, just a little announcement. Uh, their internet got, internet got cut off. So we're just gonna wait till they find it back on. Yeah, I'm here, Alexander, and what you're saying, I'm kind of thinking about um, like collective, collective social agency like how does how does agency sort of embrace a collective compassion and not only exist in um, one intuitive individual, but like are there moments of cultural shift where there's a social agency of intuition that can be collectively latched onto and activated? And how can those moments actually be sort of um, how, how can space and society be made for those moments to actually become impactful and creative and not just sort of chaotic? Oh, hello, sorry. Welcome uh, back. Our, our internet. Oh, I can't okay. hear them. Yeah, you're still a little bubbly. Robotic. Yeah, I, I, I apologize. I don't really know what's 
happening right now. If you can just give us a few more. Yeah, can't, can't really understand you. Moments. Yeah, we'll, we'll give you a few moments. No, no worries. We'll fill the space. Sarah, maybe you can, I guess you already have, but can. can yeah, we're, we're chatting. She's very drunk. <laughs> yeah, we can't even hear really your words. Let's talk about integral impact. We're really, really yes. I can't drunk hear robot. Them. Yeah. Oh, now we can hear you. <laughs> well, Lucia, I wanted to build on that and what Alexander, what you said, because what what I he heard was the shift from the the uh, I subjective to the we subjective, and how like an integral an integral space takes into account both of those uh, perspectives, and so how like in a in a business sense, how does the the business concept maybe or the the energy from that live in those different spaces. Avir is back with something. One thing that comes up is the sense of um, incentives that oftentimes the way we structure incentives in business mm -hmm has a lot to do with how people's behaviors is uh, motivated. Mm. So uh, mm. I don't know how that bridges the sort of I to we, but you know, being very conscious about what incentives are there and how we might um, continually be aware of how the incentives make people do certain things, right? Like if, if you have a boss and your opinion is different than your boss's opinion, then your incentive is not necessarily to share your opinion with your boss because it might cause conflict. Uh, and, and there might be many of these examples where the incentives pro, um, create some sort of conflict of interest or ways in which um, behavior is, is created in uh, employees, for example, or anyone in the company that um, is not desirable toward an integral vision or towards a balance sheet. And how do you make incentives that um, focus on both, you know, that make sure that- uh, Excuse me, guys, can you oh, yeah. my Go ahead. screen? We can't see your screen, but we see that you are with us again. Hi, I was wondering, can you hear me? Yeah, uh, you sound like uh, Jody Ann's drunken robot. Yeah. <laughs> this salt. So this. That's a little better. Oh. Yeah, I mean, I, I can try and I can try and do this. Yep. Just disappeared, I think. I can try. I can try and do this on my phone. Um, uh, can you can you hear me? Now. Yeah, it seems more more coherent now. If you want to send okay. your presentation, well, I can like try and sit outside. Yeah, I can. I can do do a video, uh, screen share. Um, okay, so can you see the screen? Uh, we can see something. Yes, we see your phone screen that says Zoom and then screen broadcast. But um, other than that, there's no uh, no details. It's just like you're recording your screen. Something's happening. Okay, it's starting. It's a, it's. Okay, so you cannot see Google Drive. Okay, right sorry, now. we're back. Welcome back. So sorry about that. This 
this has never happened. So really, really sorry about that. Hey, it's okay. We had a great conversation. I think actually Alexander just opened this okay. whole location in my brain that now is spinning and delightful. It went us. away. Okay, can you can you hear us? Yeah. Okay. Okay, we're 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 just getting it set up again. So this is so crazy. I'm so sorry about this. The cosmos wanted us to have a different conversation for a second. <laughs> Uh, I definitely want to come to back to that idea of incentives and where the incentives are within the, the business model. That's fascinating, Alexander. Holy smokes. I'm thinking about Colleen, yours, and Jody Ann, your business idea. Oh. Do we respond to the client's value or do we we create a, a, an integral shift through the design somehow. Okay, we can see now. You can see this, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. That was crazy. Sorry. <laughs> um, but I did catch the last bit that Sarah was mentioning. Uh, sorry, it was so crazy that I actually forgot just what you were what you had ended on, Sarah. Um, would you like to just mention it again briefly? Oh yeah, we we uh, Alexander brought in to the conversation the idea of um, uh, incentive. We were talking about intuition. We were talking yeah. about uh, agency, and uh, then it went to incentive. And is the incentive something that, like, just the whole idea of incentive? Yeah, and and conflict of interest. I don't know what to say about it. I just think that's very interesting. Yeah, I think those are big points. And uh, intuition is is a, is a tricky one because it's, I think intuition is a good start. It's it's, it's a feeling, so it's, it's mental as well as physical. Um, but honing intuition um, is something that I think each person over time develops. And incentives can feel a bit materialist, a bit reductionist but are important to create a framework. So I think these are, you're thinking about really good questions here and, and I'd like to just underline that. Um, so I'm just gonna keep moving ahead. Sorry, my, my flow is a bit, I'm a little frazzled, but <laughs> just keep going. Um, so the next section here is uh, gearing up. So, um, so it seems like there's a lot of different modalities, you know, when you're thinking about a project that come to mind it just seems like so many there's marketing accounting operations etc it just seems so complex and so for the purpose of this presentation and more generally I'm just going to simplify it to these three things strategy selling and structure all right so for strategy this is really important because this is what you want to accomplish why you want to accomplish it and your guiding principles right so what are you trying to create in the world why do you think that this should be created and what is guiding you in that process right if you come across certain incentives or conflict of interest what is it that's guiding you what are your principles uh, and then there's the process that is also part of strategy so it's great to have this vision but what is the 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 day in day out approach that you're doing to materialize this intention in an effective manner. So I'm going to bring up two ideas, uh, uh, solar and lunar, and these are archetypal themes. And the solar is like the sun. It's like the center of attention, that sense of individuality. And many times, you know, we're asking like, what is my gift? What do I want to create? What is my mission? What do I want to spend my time doing? And this is really important. Clear, this is very important because this is who we are, but there's also the other side of it, which is the lunar, right? So that is like, what is the market opportunity that that is out there that's underserved, right? That may sound a bit lame at first because like, what is my gift sounds so much more interesting, but there is a reality out there of other people, communities, needs, and many of us are very attuned to that lunar side of 
relationality, right? So what are people willing to pay for? What are competitors doing? What are needs out there that I don't even know yet, right? So maybe I have a, a general sense, I wanna create a community for therapists, but the solar approach is that vision, the lunar approach is asking the community to give you feedback that get, gets built into your system. And these two themes are very prevalent in the mainstream startup world. So I just want us in the integral community to get a sense that we're not off to the side talking about esoteric ideas only, right? Our ideas are of relevance to the very mainstream world. And these two books, Zero to One and The Lean Startup, are two of the most important books in the startup community. And I would say that Zero to One has a very solar approach. It's about defining the future you want to create and then working towards it. Whereas The Lean Startup is very lunar in that it's all about integrating the feedback of your customers and so these larger networks of relationship. Uh, and finally, metrics, uh, I think, are important when it comes to strategy. So it may feel reductionist, but it's important to define what is success, okay? Otherwise, you can get lost and hopeless because some days you'll feel like you're doing so great. The next day, you're feeling a bit down. So you don't know, are you doing well or not? Um, and metrics can be helpful in terms of actions as well as outcomes. So it's not just saying, oh, I want to reach 100 therapists this month. Maybe it is, I want to have a conversation with, with uh, you know, 200 of them, or I want to go to five conferences uh, this quarter. So it's not just about outcomes, which is important, but it's also about inputs, things you can do that you have a bit more control over. The outcomes are what matter at the end, but the inputs are the steps on the journey. So the bottom line on strategy is that there is no single formula it's a mix of intuition and feedback. So it's that internal drive as well as what the world is telling you. I'd encourage everybody to start building cheaply. Okay, don't build some big thing, take all these years and invest all this money to create something and then show it to people. I would get in front of people sooner and let them guide you. So it's that mix of solar and lunar, right? It's your vision and then people are critiquing, commenting, giving feedback on your vision. Don't invest too much money or time before identifying these people that you're trying to help or serve. Have clarity about your principles. Talk to as many people as you can and share your ideas. I think being locked up in a room is great for a certain stage, but after that, there's a whole world out there of, of people that you know we never knew were there. So getting to know them, reaching out, trying to just catch up with them is, is great and have metrics, okay? I know that doesn't sound very integral or, or whatever you want to call it. Metric sounds kind of lame, very reductionist rather, but I think it is very important to have a sense of is progress being made towards your goals or not. So this is the selling component. Uh, so there's real work versus fake work. So uh, each this is going to be different for all of us, uh, but just to give a sense, okay, real work is like your value is being built, people are being engaged, your metrics, you know, you're working towards these metrics and you're driving sales and sales can mean whatever it means to you, right? Sales just means your value is getting into the hands of other people. And there's a sense of fake work, right? It's like you're sitting at your desk, you, you've, you've blocked out time, but you know that you're avoiding the hard thing that you're scared to do, right? Maybe you're scared to pick up the phone and call somebody, or maybe you're scared to you know, put a price on what you're trying to sell. Um, so it's just like doing a lot of stuff that's not really connected to this larger goal. Maybe you're, you're making your product so perfect that it never gets out there, or you're spending all your time learning everything you can about a subject without getting into the world. And, you know, it's about uh, not this secondhand information in books and things like that, but really learning from the world. So there's a sense of real work versus fake, fake work I just want to put out there. And there's the sense of uh, messy startups as well. Just give me a second. I'll just, or could you grab a glass? Uh, messy startups, okay? So when you're focused on real problems, fake problems will pile up and you will feel like throwing up maybe. It, it, it has happened to me where as the pace increases and everything starts like, oh my God, I have like a zillion things I need to do. Everybody's needing everything from me yesterday. You may feel like throwing up, it's okay. Uh, it's, it can be very overwhelming, but I think it's important to have a sense of clarity around what is fake work and what is real work and what really matters. You know, if really what matters is 
is getting to a hundred therapists for your for your network, then it's okay that like other things are a bit late. It's okay you didn't respond to every email. It's okay, and over time you should hire people uh, as possible to handle less essential things. This is critical for scale. This is the only way it's going to happen. You know, if if you if you or your your co-founder are the only people ever working on this thing it'll be very hard to scale. So you have to have a clear sense of what is the very difficult, eating the frog, difficult work that only you can do, and then avoid everything else until you absolutely have to deal with it, and then hire people or, or grow your team rather to, to handle less essential things. Um, prospecting, okay, we're talking about selling right now. So prospecting means just getting your thing out there, right? So uh, let's say you're, you're doing this, uh, you know, nature guided tours in nature. All right. There's an approach we sometimes have where we're trying to be cool. We want to be like easy and we want to wait for uh, just things to come to us. We, we don't want to be too hard. We don't want to seem like a salesperson. But I think if your mission is important, if your project is important, then you need to balance this sense of empathy and the success of your project. Like it's okay sometimes to, to create a bit of, uh, a ch uh, you know, to to be driven, it's okay to be driven towards your goal, right? So prospecting uh, would be like picking up the phone and dialing people, right? If you have a list of people you know are interested in it, get get in front of them, right? Uh, you can send them a LinkedIn or a Facebook or something at the same time as an email, at the same time as a phone call. This is a way to really build their impression of you, because if they have no idea who you are you're going to need to like get in touch with them like 10, 20 times for them to know you. So this might mean that like you sent an email today, you sent an email a couple days later, you sent an email a week later. That may sound really terrible, but if you are caring about them and you know what you're sharing is of value, then it's okay, right? It's it there is this is an important step in getting your mission out there. And if you aren't willing to interrupt people, like you only want to wait for the perfect moment where they just happen to come across you, and many, you know, you're increasing the chance that your whole project will fail because there's a lot of people out there who want to engage with what you have, but just don't know about it or they're busy or their lives are just busy, right? This is a book I, I would recommend to like kind of get into that mindset. Um, here's an example of a prospecting cadence. So this is something that companies would use. Any one of you can use. And it's just a way to think about what might be required to close, especially some of your initial sales. So the first day you, you phoned somebody and you emailed them, the next day you phone them again and then you email them again. On the fourth day you email them, on the fifth day you gave them a phone call, on the sixth day you contacted them on LinkedIn, sent them an email, on the eighth day you phone call them again. So I'm not saying that this is the situation for every project, but I want to give people a sense of what is the standard expectation when it comes to doing sales. Like this is kind of what it looks like. It's, it's, this is at least six to 10 emails over the course of a month. You tried calling them a couple of times at least, right? So this is a way to begin thinking about it, that it's not just, oh, I sent an email, I didn't hear back and so it's over. Um, and then here's the sales component. So that is all prospecting. Sales is when someone is actually interested and may be able to engage with what you're offering. So you wanna become a trusted advisor um, they may not know how your solution helps them. They may not know if you're doing a nature guided tour, but they've done a lot of retreats in the past. So you got a list of 500 people who went to a certain retreat, but they don't, they may not know that you with your skill, what you're going to bring to them. So this is where education comes in, right? And that is different than making somebody feel insecure or making them feel bad if they didn't take your thing. It's about educating them, helping them understand where your value is can help them. Uh, this book, The Challenger Sale, is used by enterprise sales, so it's it's for much larger companies, but basically what it's saying is break their paradigm. And I think this is great for integral projects because what you're doing is you are teaching them something new about the things they really value. So they might say, you know, I don't need nature retreats. I, mean, I work out every morning, that's good enough, right? And so if you're able to break that paradigm and, and sort of teach them something like, did you know that by going on nature retreats, your workouts will be even better? And here's all this research I did that helps you helps you learn this. Here's somebody who went on a nature retreat and they got promoted. 
later that year and they believe it's because of the nature retreat so you are breaking this paradigm they have and then within the new paradigm you have created you will become an inevitable source of value right you are guiding people towards what it is that you are offering and here creative tension is okay like again it's okay to sort of be a teacher and to say i know you don't know that this is important yet but it is and here's why so it's okay for there to be a bit of tension somebody's just trying to you know uh, trying to just avoid the reality of what you're sharing it's okay for there to be a bit of tension in fact that works well um because people feel as if you know what you're talking about and then you know having confidence and being in a good mood i think is really essential right you don't want to get on the phone right after you ate like a really terrible lunch and like you're in a bad mood like you want to be positive a good source of energy that's very helpful to sales. You want to just assume that it's going to work out. Um, now we go to marketing. And, and again, I know this is a lot of material in this real section. You know, this is just touching on all these modalities. But um, so don't feel overwhelmed. But I did want to give everybody a, a sense of this in my own voice, like at a high level. So marketing, if you're a very small company, marketing is a kind of a luxury. It depends on what you're trying to create. Um, but if you are to do it, you want a strong and unique perspective based on your idiosyncrasies, right? So you don't want to create a fashion brand that looks like every other fashion brand out there to just try and fit in, right? We are integral change makers. We have a very unique, strong perspective. And this involves a lot of creative experimentation at a certain cutting edge, okay? So it's okay, like all of us are creating things that have never been created before. So it's okay to have that strong perspective and create and, and, and create content to educate people and inspire them. Um, and remember the purpose of marketing is to drive sales, right? So don't get too lost in this as if it is an art project. There is a creative side to marketing, but it is not an art project completely, right? It is at the end, an investment of time, maybe of money to drive sales. Um, and so try and make it cheap and interesting and useful at the outset. Right? Don't do some big campaign before you even know who it is you're selling to, what their concerns are, you know, like before you've had hundreds of conversations so you deeply understand who you're trying to help. You know, if you just create a marketing campaign, it may fall a bit flat. So make it cheap, make it interesting, make it useful. I love what Patagonia does at a much bigger level. They create documentaries about you know, conserving nature. And so it's like, what does that have to do with clothes, right? Shouldn't they have an ad of just uh, some model walking down the street wearing Patagonia jacket. But no, it's like they're educating a worldview, right? That's what they're doing. It's a worldview. Um, here's an example of influencer marketing. That is something that was pretty large uh, uh, in the past couple of years. Something to think about, you know, meeting other people who care about what you're doing. Maybe there's other nature wilderness guides out there and maybe you can help them out if in exchange they represent what you're doing. And here's Lululemon, they do like yoga workshops in their stores. So this is what marketing is. It's not sales, you're not closing the deal, but you're building a worldview, a world that people can stand, step into, but just be conscious of the expense and the focus required. Here's a biz dev funnel. Um, you are really getting the 101 here, and I'm gonna put this whole presentation on my website later so you can go through it, um, but basically saying you can think of business development and selling as a funnel where you have strangers at the top, people who've never met you, have no idea who you are. Over time, they get to know you, but it's, it's just one step warmer than a stranger. And then they turn into a lead, let's say. So let's say there's, you know, you know Stacy in Portland uh, has always wanted to go on a wilderness tour, but uh, a retreat, but ne has never been. Uh, she she goes to some workshop and you find out that she has gone there. And so you send her an email. Maybe you send her a Facebook message. You say, hey, this is what I'm doing. Check it out. So she comes to it as a visitor, checks out your website. So maybe there's a landing page on your website explaining what you do. There's a brochure. Um, and then from that, she schedules a meeting to, to meet with you and learn more. And that's what you call a sales meeting, right? Maybe it's just a 30 minute overview of what the program is. And then finally, once she actually goes on this uh, experience, she comes back and she helps to build the worldview out in the world. So you want to help turn her into such, she loves so much what you have shared 
that she turns into a promoter. Now she's saying, oh, did you hear about, you know, Deep Wilderness Retreat? It was so amazing. It really helped me. So that is a biz dev funnel as it would apply to any one of your projects. And at the top here, in addition to blog and workshop, you can have phone calls and outbound sort of reaching. Um, finally, branding. Uh, in terms of naming your project, you want to choose a name that's unique but relevant. Um, I think somebody is on the phone. Can I mute them? Okay. Uh, okay. So the ideal name is unique but relevant. So Plumber Co., right? If you're a plumbing company, that is too generic because there's Plumber Co. in every state probably. And how are you going to build a, a website domain name on it? Anytime somebody's referring to plumber co, you know, it could be any any of the plumbers in the world. So it's just too generic. But if you were to name your plumbing company like Zincro Crash LLC, that's too random, right? Maybe it works because it's such a unique name that you can build on top of it, but it doesn't create that feeling. And Shiny Pipes could be a good name for a plumbing company because it's it's unique, but it's also relevant to the business or the project, it's, it evokes a feeling like, yeah, hmm, I want shiny pipes. One of them that I love is Twitter. I mean, it's a very large company, but I just love Twitter. Like it's a, it's a sound, you know, and it just gives you that feeling of being in a place, sharing these little pops. Um, that is of course a very successful project, but that is a, a brand name that I, I, I always think of as really cool. Um, you don't need a very flashy logo. Don't go all out, spend thousand dollars on getting a logo made. I would recommend, right? Because at the start, before you have a lot of customers or people who are supporting your project, you, your resources are so scarce. So don't go too crazy. Um, just make sure it's simple, readable in a variety of formats. If it's small on a business card or it's larger on, a, on some other format, it should be readable. And nounproject.com is a great example of a place where they have a lot of little icons. You can download one for $3, use it however you want. It's good enough to get going, right? It's good enough to get going. Um, of course, if, if you have a, you know, a fashion brand or a design studio, maybe it's a different level of focus required on the brand, but generally speaking, it's okay. You know, just choose, choose something, a decent name, get a decent logo out there and, and start moving. Uh, bottom line on selling, this is really important. A lot of time should be invested here. You know, apart from building your service or product or your cultural artifact, um, a lot of time should go towards doing this because this is what means that your project will live, right? There's others out there who see enough value in what you're doing that they're willing to give you resources to continue doing it. That's basically what sales is, right? Those resources can be donations, can be purchases, can just even be time and awareness. Uh, you want to start with hand-to-hand -hand sales, right? So this sense of like really going after each person one at a time to build your initial group of supporters and then scale to marketing. Don't be too afraid to do this. It's Sometimes it's easier to just sit behind a website and hope people show up, but nobody really does. So start with the hand-to-hand -hand and you'll learn a lot about yourself, about people by doing this. Uh, don't burn too much money up front. Don't be afraid of your unique point of view. Um, once somebody accepts your point of view, your solution is a very natural thing for them to continue with. And, you know, have confidence and good energy and eat the frog, like do the hard work. Uh, don't be afraid of, you know, we're all here to grow. I mean, if we were already worthy of our projects, they would already exist, right? So we have to become uh, uh, we have to grow to, to be worthy of materializing the project we are envisioning. Finally, structure. Okay, uh, I think we have about 20 minutes left here. So I apologize that I've been blitzing through this real section. It, it is quite a lot of information, but I hope as people are listening, they get a sense that these are not alien concepts and they're not something to be afraid of, but it's something that is relevant to whatever it is that you are trying to do as an integral change maker. So in terms of structure, I want to start with body and soul. Okay, this is probably already self evident for many people, but I just think it's worth mentioning, right? Minimal amounts of junk food. Okay, if, if, if there is like an emotional thing around eat, you know, like leaning onto ice cream, like just try to edit that stuff out of your life over time, I would recommend working out every day if possible, or doing something to get into your body, 
uh, emotional grounding in love, friendship, and family. So as an integral change maker, this is not about locking yourself away and, and, and you know, just burning up your life to just do this thing. It's, it's about a lifestyle, right? You're, it's integral. It's not just the project. It's you. It's your family. It's your relationships. It's your body. All of this is part of the journey. Um, having regular inspiration, you know, going into nature, like always make time for these sorts of things, I believe. Uh, one thing I do, you know, maybe it's like I always have a, a lemon juice with an apple cider vinegar in the morning. I often have a, a smoothie in the afternoon. These are little things that help give my body what it needs. And it's just something I've really appreciated. And I would say this is critical for quote unquote integral decision making, right? Because if you're stressed, if you're upset, if you missed all of your friends events and you're sad, you know, you may start to compromise on your values. And so it's hard to be an integral change maker. In some ways, it might be easier to just do a regular commercial project. Okay. So you're, we're gearing up here for a multi-year struggle for your vision to come to life. And so just keep this sense in mind of your body and soul are essential. That is the source in a way of the value that you are trying to share, right? And so if you're just sacrificing yourself for this value, that's a very short term mindset. Uh, also core reasons. So it's going to get hard. It's not going to work. Your mom is going to say something to you. Your friends are going to be going on vacation or you know, whatever it is, like, it's gonna get hard. So why are you going through this? Okay, why are you going through this? It's really fun in the first few months, but then you settle in and you're like, wow, this is requiring a lot more than I thought. So why are you going through hell? Why are you taking the hard path? Why are you putting in all this work? And what do you see in your future success? So I think it's helpful to write down your reasons. Like, I want to do wilderness guide, guiding, project because I want my life to be filled with this ability to share inspiration deeply, right? Or it might be because I don't want to work in uh, doing a job that I dislike and I imagine this time when I'll be free to really live my integral life. Or it might be like I because I, I'm, I really want to become better as, an, as a nature guide. Um, so what are your reasons? I think it's okay to be selfish to some extent, okay? We don't want to be so selfless because yourself is part of the mystery of the cosmos. Like if you want to just be able to live in a ranch in the in the wilderness and that's why you're doing this, that's okay, okay? So just be clear about why you are going through this hard process because it probably will get quite hard at some point. Aim high. Because if, if it's just a small reward, like if you're just going after something peanuts, right, it's just not worth it because it's really hard. You probably should just join someone else's mission because to forge your own path is, is challenging. So I, and I want to re, reclaim the sense of, you know, being ambitious or wanting influence or making money. It, they are all part of the cosmos. They're not just flat out evil, right? You wanted to just you know, live in a nice apartment in New York City. That's not evil. It's not the worst thing like devil incarnate. It's okay to want a life, to take care of your children, to have to have experiences in the world of, of you know, seeing the world. It's okay. And I would say it's better to have integral leaders than the pure materialists, right? So better to have, you know, like billionaires who are pure materialists who believe there is no soul in the cosmos? Or is it better to have somebody who's integral and who is forced to reckon with these challenging ideas? Somebody at the United Nations, like it's better to have a hardcore materialist who believes that statistics are all that matter? Or is it better to have a hard driving politician who has integral values, but is negotiating with and working with the world? So I would recommend aiming high uh, because that's what makes it worth it. And that's what maybe makes them an interesting adventure as well to aim for that. Um, all right, now we're looking at other forms of structure. This is accounting. Again, this presentation will be on my website. So you can, and I'm gonna share my email as well to, if anybody wants to just get a bit more info. But at a high level, I would recommend opening a business bank account, using something like QuickBooks to do your accounting, Hire a cheap bookkeeper in the Philippines on Upwork, which is going to be about $20 to $30 a month. They will help you categorize all of your expenses. And if you can, or later on, I think a decent tax lawyer is great. 
because they help you maximize your deductions, okay? What it means to maximize a deduction means that if you have spent things on your business, then the government is set up in a way to make that considered as an investment you're making, right? So it's not something that they're charging you out of your pocket. The government is kind of helping you. In a sense, the US government has some pro-business policies to help change makers by allowing this thing called deductions, okay? And I think if you if you do all this cleanly, uh, then you avoid an audit, any problems in the future. And if you were to use a business credit uh, or like a business loan or a business credit card, that doesn't affect your personal uh, credit score. And also personal budgeting is crucial because you're gearing up for a multi-year struggle. You don't know when it's gonna work out. So you need a budget is a great simple tool for anybody who uh, is looking to get a bit more tight on their personal budgeting. Um, so this is just a quick touch on the accounting side. Uh, legal, you know, incorporate using something like LegalZoom or Northwest. Um, uh, in terms of corporate structures, an LLC is better than a sole proprietorship. Um, I forget the exact reason, but I think it comes down to liability. Uh, an LLC means that it's a limited liable, liability company. And so you are not personally liable for the business. So nobody can sue you directly. And this is, this is legal, right? It, it may sound strange to be talking about getting sued in an integral change maker presentation, but hey, this is the legal slide. And so that's why you have this corporate structure. And in terms of taxation, an LLC can be taxed as a pass-through or as a C-corp. And that means that you're either treating it as if it's just an extension of your individual person or it's a separate thing. So there's more flexibility there. So if it's a very small thing, you're not looking to raise investment, an LLC is, is, is a great option. If you are looking to, to go bigger, if you're looking to raise investment, you're looking for donors or, well, not donors, sorry, angel investors, then you would be looking at a Delaware C Corp. Uh, that's what you're going to set up. And there's, a, there's an issue around being taxed twice. And that's why it's only for if you're raising investment, but it could also be like help you save taxes. It's a bit more heavier to run. Uh, in terms of this consulting templates, NDA contracts, use the templates online and you can have a brief consultation with a lawyer using Upwork. So Upwork is a place where professionals share their time uh, at an hourly rate. So if you found a decent lawyer, you know, you just had 30 minutes to, to talk to her, uh, that could be great. Um, and don't burn too much money, right? And, and if you're going big, again, this is, I'm sure there's a lot of variation, but I just wanna say, let's imagine someone in Integral Change Maker is trying to set up a large company uh, then consider approaching a serious law firm that does work with startups and often they will work with you free until you raise your first round, okay? Uh, finances, uh, you, you want an income statement and that's what this thing on the right-hand side is. So at the very top, you're just putting how the money is coming in uh, from the different sources. So if you have a few different sources of income, that's where it is. Then you're listing your expenses, right? I need to pay money for my rent or for my mobile phone or for my marketing, whatever it is, you're just listing it all down. That's your income statement, basically speaking. And a financial model is an income statement that extends over multiple years. So you may have a monthly uh, model where it's like the first three months, nobody has signed up, but in month four, three people will sign up. In month five, 10 people will sign up. So. It's a way for you to show your assumptions. It's a way for you to think about what are the what are the structures and the inputs and outputs that your project is going to involve, right? And if, if you're serious about doing this project, you are going to have to work with those inputs and outputs. So just putting it all onto a spreadsheet like this is that's why people do that. And unit economics means like for each wilderness tour that you sell, you're selling it for a thousand dollars for three days. The food is going to cost $200 per person and you need an assistant who is charging you, you know, $150 for the three days. And so you end up with per wilderness tour sold, what is the profitability? And you want to make sure that you are profitable per wilderness tour because otherwise you could sell 10 and 10 of them and each one is losing you and your project money and then you're being driven into the ground. Uh, that's not how you create something sustainable. 
and YouTube, Udemy, you, a lot of resources to get deeper into all of these. Just look look through those um, lessons that people are putting up. Okay, so we have about 10 minutes left. Um, we're almost near the end. I think we, it's, it's okay to go a little bit over maybe oh, for okay. questions and stuff. So, okay, yeah. great. So yeah, I, I would definitely wanna have space open for questions, but on the investment side, uh, Use that prospecting approach I mentioned where you're trying to reach out to people to talk to angel investors or donors, right? So you want to try and reach 20, 30, 50, 100 investors. All of these people are looking to get involved in good projects. And you want to soft pitch the friendly ones. You want to keep pitching your project. Somebody will have 20 years of experience in this field. Someone else has, you know, nine years of experience in this other domain they will all like cut and polish what you're working on and you, you know they, they will they will help reject you in the right ways to help you sharpen so there's things like startup school which is a free, which is a free uh online education for entrepreneurship by y combinator that that sort of thing like incubators applying to these sorts of incubators and accelerators it can help clarify your thinking you know when i applied to yc for numinous realm it really helped me think of like, cause I was coming straight from PCC. I was coming from a very different mindset. And so it just got me into the mindset that I was gearing up to, to engage. Uh, be clear on what your values are before getting investors involved because they will have control, right? Investors purchase, even donors, right? If you have a major donor, they have a certain say over your project now. So just be clear what it is. Uh, and if you're if you're having investors, they will expect a return, right? Unless it's a grant, they are putting in ten dollars so that they can make back fifty dollars. And so you are on a certain path to keep raising money over time or to go public. But the stronger your project is, the better your terms are. So that's why you want to try and get as far as you can on your own uh, in a certain way of thinking, right? Many times other teams are are raising money much earlier. But I think as integral change makers, because the values we are living with are so important, I personally am taking this path of like trying to get as far as I can before getting other people involved as investors and, and maybe even not getting investors involved. I, it's something I've really sat with and I've been doing this project for like five years now. A lot of people have said just raise money, including family members are saying like, you know, you need to be doing this or that, but it's tough to be an integral change maker. So I think investment is can be a very helpful part of the ecosystem, but just be aware of what you're getting into and recognize your strength, right? Many times people are like, oh, investors, they're so important. Investors are so important, but investors would be nothing without organizations and, and entrepreneurs or change makers. You know, they would be nowhere without people who are sacrificing their life to create something. So recognize your value come into the situation with a sense of confidence and equality. Don't see this person who has money to donate or invest as just way more important than you, okay? Bottom line, you have no idea how long it's gonna take. Aim high, there's no failure, just growth. You're gonna keep learning and growing. Stay strong and motivated, connecting to your family, your body, uh, minimize your expenses and it may take a while for the long haul. Like you may have to take other jobs on the side. You may have to do consulting. I myself, you know, took a, a year and a half as a consultant. Currently I work full time, but the project didn't die, right? It is hard because I didn't come out the gate, raise a bunch of money right away and then scale in ways that I didn't know. I needed some time to figure it out. But then again, don't be a martyr. Live an integral life, like enjoy your life. Feel good about the world that you're in and that's created you. And, you know, focus on the important things, building your product or your service or, or refining your service um, and, and outsource the less important things or give it to other team members uh, as possible. Uh, finally, pitch, you know, so me ask a, a little bit on the pitching. Um, so here's a, the structure from y, y Combinator. Uh, they would say start with a title and a one line description on the first slide. Second set of slides or slide is just cleanly stating your problem and detailing this pain, right? So it's like, let's say title, wilderness tours, one line description, uh, deep, deep um, okay, off the top of my head, this is hard to be like really uh, sort of 
masterly strategic, but let's just say like deep, um, deep wilderness tours uh, based on, you know, new philosophy. Okay. So you're cleaning, cleanly stating the problem and detailing the pain. People are stuck in cities. They never have a chance to connect deeply to nature. Suicide rates are going up and so is addiction. And in fact, in, in, in San Francisco, like with the pandemic, this is even bigger deal and people need to have this. So here's the solution concisely. We give one week long wilderness tours with a very special uh, integral twist. And we bring in uh, world-class experts to help facilitate the process. And then traction is really important. This is the very material side of it. You know, how many people are getting involved? How many people have you reached out to? This is a very important component. In the end, to certain types of people, this traction is all that really matters, unless it's super early stage. But again, I would recommend that you get going a bit before you are uh, getting others involved as investors. Then what's your secret sauce? You can say like we have tied up with, you know, three top academics that have agreed to not work with anybody else. And so we have this very special thing we're doing that nobody else can. And that's great for investors because they want to put their money into something that they know it is safe, right? Someone else can't just start the same thing and then take all the attention away. Um, your unit economics and your business model would be the next set of slides and then your projections for growth, okay? So that's Y Combinator. They are a tech accelerator. So it's a very particular cultural group, um, but they do a lot of pitches. So this is what they recommend. But I would also say like, tell your authentic story, right? As an integral change maker, you know, it's not been easy to get to this point. Uh, you sh you have some very real life experiences that have, have brought you here. And so carry that with you. Carry the soil and the dirt and the challenge and the heartbreak and the joy, you know, be be your pitch, right? It's not just putting it as a slide, but and make it feel like an adventure. Make whoever's listening to your pitch get really captivated. So it's not some dry set of of facts okay um, but you should keep those material points earlier in mind don't be afraid to look stupid right as integral change makers it's a very experimental phase we are in in the evolution of of humanity so we're gonna be trying a lot of things and many will not work and some will work amazingly and then everybody else will copy it so don't be afraid to try things Keep pitching as much as you can. Maybe pitch once a week to your friend or somebody else who's been in the space. Let them keep giving you feedback. Research pitch decks of projects you like and don't be afraid uh, of what everybody says has to be done, okay? Don't sell out. That doesn't mean don't negotiate with the world, but don't be afraid that you have to give up what you believe is important just to fit in. Uh, ending with this, pray not for an easy path, but to become worthy of the path you have chosen. So I think we are in this for an adventurous life and growth is being asked of all of us to become the person who is capable of bringing this vision into the world. Um, this so-called integral revolution, you know, I believe it really is a phase of consciousness. It's going to define the next few centuries. We're just at the start of it. And here's a picture of Galileo uh, being uh, sort of facing the Catholic Church which was the dawn of modernity in many ways. And we see how that evolved in the world it birthed for us, right? So there are future beings, 100 to 300 years out, who will live in the world that we're helping to create. So enjoy your path, you know, learn all this, absorb it, um, be sharp, be smart, be fearless, uh, carry your weapons into battle, um, but, but uh, don't give up on, on why it is you're doing what you're doing. Okay. So that's it. Um, thank you very much. Uh, this is my email and uh, website where I'm going to put this presentation. So yeah, that's it. And I'd open it up for any questions or, you know, any, any quick discussion. Thank you, Abir. That was just so amazing i feel like i want you to be my consultant for my future businesses <laughs> um i just want to kind of re-emphasize what you said at the very ending which i which kind of struck me even though i've already thought of this just the way you said it was like oh yeah that's true um that this integral consciousness is kind of a new and future oriented 
humanity endeavor. And to me, when I, when I see this in integral consciousness, I see businesses that um, sort of like engage in forms above forms and not just sort of like transaction of objects or interest in economics, or all these things, but they're really like, how can these business ideas be integrated into human development, into aesthetics, into new forms of relating to one another? Like that's sort of what I'm hearing about this in integral approach to, to business. It's more like a business as a being and seeing within that being all these layers of, of activity. Like how is the, how is the, the, the larynx functioning in this being? How is the pancreas functioning? How are the ribs holding up? Like kind of seeing all these business structures as a health oriented living organism that, that isn't bound to a sort of static structure, but really is sort of like a mirror image to the human being as a living being that is relating to people and actually bringing communities together in multiple various ways um, that embrace a much more expanded state of consciousness that is not like segmenting things in, in these very um, isolated, siloed ways. Yeah, that's really great. I would love to hear uh, other people's sort of reflections on what Lucien just shared. Um, but I would mention that it makes me think of Sheldrake in a sense of a morphic field. And an organization like this is, yeah, it is a it is a transpersonal being that we're playing a part in, but it's not only us. There's a, a larger mystery that we're helping to carry. But I'd love to hear more discussion or, or thoughts. You know, e Echo, I, I, we, I haven't heard from you uh, yet. I, I don't know if you have any thoughts on what Lucien shared or, or anything else. Hi, Pierre, thank you so much for your presentation. And I think it's very helpful for me to uh, dive into my actually uh, suspended integral thoughts. Like Lucia mentioned before, the spring times took away my studying time a lot. And uh, uh, for my reflection, actually, I've been business, my small business, business for many years, almost 10 years. And I am truly agree with you that we, what we are doing is actually pitching ourselves. And uh, why I came to CIS is I think I, I have too many ideas and I don't know how to uh, integrate them together to present to my clients, to my, uh, or into my business. So uh, recent, uh, recently I'm in a stage to put in a real, real business uh, model like you mentioned in your presentation to uh, construct a, a business model and to um, sell my minimal viable program to my uh, clients. So uh, I totally agree with all of you have mentioned I'm I am in the progress of working on it. So thank you. Thank you for helping me to review all of the process. Yeah, what is uh, this uh, new project about? Just briefly, what is it going to be about? I'm doing educational program. My clients, my targeted uh, clients is from the teenager students from 13 to 19 years old about their uh, high school and college admission as well as their growth development. And I, I would like to uh, integrate uh, wellness, physical wellness and the well mental wellness and the parents' kids relationship, psychological um, issues uh, and the counseling or the coaching skills into this program. Hmm. So that's what I'm doing now. Cool. Thank you, Echo. Thank you. Uh, Jody Ann, I, I didn't hear from you. If, if you're open to it, would you care to share what you're working on or any reflections? 
Um, I laughed a lot during your presentation because I could have used it a year ago when I started my business. Um, I am a, um, a body liberation trainer and health coach. So what that means is that I'm weight neutral and um, body positive, fat positive. Um, so that's a growing niche in the health industry and um, in the fitness industry and the yoga industry. And um, yeah, and yeah. <laughs> and my new idea, my new idea is something um, because it's a growing niche, there are lots of other trainers and fitness instructors and yoga instructors like me who are now seeing things from a different point of view. Um, the traditional fitness model really drives people to eating disorder, to body shame, to weight stigma, to weight bias. And so there's a lot of um, people working in this realm. And so my idea, the new idea, not the business I've had for a year, but the new idea is to build a collective of those individuals um, and create like a directory um, and hopefully a bank of free um, resources for people so that they can get access to that kind of um, fitness and yoga and other movement professionals um, when they want them, when they want yeah. them. Which of these uh, skills that was brought up do you feel uh, was maybe not as much there over the past year as, as you mentioned? All of them. Um, but I think the one that, you know, you kept coming back to about, um, I know that my biggest problem is being almost like embarrassed about how close this is to me personally and how much of myself is in this. And so like, for example, what you mentioned about influencer culture, this is how most of the, that influencer culture stuff that's happening on social media that's been happening for years is, um, is where most professionals that are doing what I'm doing are getting noticed and like, and getting clients. But I have been very hesitant to put myself, I mean, I'm there, but I don't put my story there because it's, um, I, like, I, I just don't have the, I have the courage to start the business, but I don't have the courage to put my story out there like that, to that degree. Right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Fair enough. And uh, it is a struggle, but I'm glad to hear that you're on this path and continuing forward. So uh, let's see uh, if, if people are okay for a couple more minutes to hang out. Um, I know that um, Sarah wanted to uh, get more input, but before that, I also wanted to just check in with Adriana. I haven't had a chance to hear from you. If you're open to sharing what you're working on or any reflections, uh, please feel welcome. Hi, thank you for including me. I didn't even see my camera was on. I don't know how that happened. Uh, I am like multitasking and uh, listening to it because I really appreciate all the vision. And right now I'm like uh, holding off on my own business that I want to create like probably next year. But right now I just don't have the time for it. So I'm like my antennas are collecting all the information. And I just really appreciate all the integral approach. Um, which is kind of like rare in some places. So I, I really appreciate having that and like thinking and just being with that, like alive and fresh in my mind until my time comes. So I appreciate you including me. Thank you. Your time will come. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Rachel, I see your, your video is off, uh, but if, if you are open to feel free to join in, otherwise we can uh, get to uh, Sarah's question. Um, well, Lucia knows I like to talk, <laughs> so I have no problem sharing. Um, everyone, I actually joined a little bit late. Um, so, hi, and thank you so much um, for all the wonderful information. Hi. Oh. Hey, Rachel, it sounds like your, your voice dropped. Oh, no. Okay, you're back. Yes. Okay. So, um, 
I, uh, my, my business uh, is called Sanctuary. Uh, my, my project or my mission is to provide sanctuary, um, respite and rejuvenation spaces for black women. And my idea brought in from uh, an event I did over the summer um, that was focused on um, pleasure and intimacy and beauty as tools for wellness. Um, for black women, I did an event called Pleasure Camp over the summer wellness retreat. And over, I just think the events of last year really um, had me just thinking about this lack of sanctuary. I actually heard that term, um, heard that idea expressed uh, from a lecture of it, from a PhD talking about how in so many spaces where um, that are set out to be safe spaces like churches or your own bedroom or a school or a supermarket um, are not places of safety for black women. And um, so I really wanted to address that. And also just amidst all of the social justice issues that have um, really been um, given a lot of spotlight over the last year, I started thinking about all of the women on the front lines of these like social justice battles and how I could not do or engage um, in many of the fights that they were just my own temperament, my own body chemistry. Um, but I appreciate like the feely strength that a lot of those fights require. And it made me think about how much I wanted to take care of those women. So I think I've always wanted to be a nurturer. I've always wanted to connect with women. I've always wanted to take care of women. And so this seed, which started from my very personal experience, has just kind of grown and grown. And like I said, first it started with this idea of intimacy and beauty as wellness tools and then I feel like it blossomed from there to just this larger idea of providing black women sanctuary spaces where they can be like restored prayed over loved on encouraged you know played with all of those things so that they can like return to um, engage um, in the world in all these really important ways for, on behalf of all of us so that's what I'm working on. So I think I want to start with these amazing retreats for Black women. Yeah. And what would you say is an obstacle or the one of the big ones in your way to at, that you're working on to bring this vision out? Um, I think just buying in. Um, at, you know, a cellular level to the worthiness of this endeavor, um, because I think that would lead me to manage my time um, very differently. And so that's what I'm, that's kind of what I'm feeling like at a crossroads with right now. Like, I am very solar. <laughs> I have vision. Um, I am very intuitive. And now I feel like to incorporate that lunar part of myself um, is going to require a great amount of effort and intention. So I'm ruminating on, well, this idea is really worthy. Let's think we should be about that. So that's, I think it's like moving to the next forward and materializing this vision. Yeah. Cool. Thank you for sharing. And maybe a fellow teammate or, or co-founder who brings some of the skills that or, or perspective that's different than yours could right. also be a way to do it. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, I want to get to uh, Jody Ann. But just before I do, I realize I did not bring Alex. I did not ask Alexander yet. I know you are working with uh, some teams and you have experience, you know, creating business systems. I was just wondering what are some, you know, did any, what of this really resonated with you or what do you find your mentees need the most help with or, or that you're sharing of value? 
Yeah, thank you. A lot of them are still pretty early stage. So a lot, a lot of what you're saying is, is very helpful. And in terms of structure, finding structure and getting familiar with sort of the language and the vocabulary around how you think about, you know, setting up a bank account, uh, structuring, um, you know, getting uh, clients or, or doing sales. Uh, I find with the, the mentees I have, they're, they're even a little before that, they're sort of still putting together the vision. Uh, but all of this is about to like come, you know, like a tsunami crashing onto them. And I think uh, in terms of, let's see, finding motivation has been a huge one, right? Like finding out what, how do you hone down what is really important to you to the point that you you believe in this, that you can spend every day working on this when it gets really rough. Like the moment you said, you know, you, you're about to vomit or you feel like you, you did vomit or whatever it was, that's some serious commitment, right? <laughs> like it takes you to get up afterwards and say like, yeah, this sucks, this is terrible, but I, I'm really a believer of this idea. And I think this idea will have, will change things. And I think what I see mostly is, and this is also from at least the tech investing side, what people look at when they're looking at founders is how committed and how um, uh, crafty are these individuals behind these projects, right? Like, is this someone we can just throw in a room with a couple of tools and then they will start building something and make it work, uh, you know, without all the, the bells and whistles. So however you can like hone down and like, cut out all the, you were talking about the lean startup, right? So cut out all the unnecessary stuff and focus on that, which you know that you can like go through fire for. Um, that to me seems like one of the key points. And then all the other stuff is is hard still, right? It's like trying to get your bearings and all these architectures and, and systems setting up the business and how to approach all these things. That's hard, but that can be figured out. You just have to be able to focus on things and talk to the right people. And I think that's also part of what we're doing here collectively is uh, I'm starting to see crystallize these, these uh, nodes in the network of like, oh, this person has some expertise here. This person has some expertise there. And that's all bringing this together. I think that makes things easier. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that essence, right? I think for integral change makers, what is that idea? It feels like people are still developing. And then once they have that essence, how do they continue to work only on that and not get distracted over time? Uh, Jody ann you, you wanted to bring something up? Yeah, I just wanted to say, I don't know how to make that hand go away. So I, I'll, I'll, okay, there it goes. Okay, good. Okay, no, I wanted to say that, um, I wanted to say that your concept of fake work versus real work was extremely helpful. And I have been doing so much fake work um, in this last year. And one really clear example of that was, uh, I tried to develop an app and I tried to do it all by myself literally all by myself and um and i spent so much money and so much time um on something that my clients didn't even want um and so yeah so when you talked about fake work i i laughed and uh realized that that's a huge um that's a problem for me um and i and i make the fake work because i'm afraid of the real work so I thank you for allowing me to make that realization. Yeah, sure. And I want to redeem that a little bit as well, that it's hard to know what is the fake work until you have some experience, right? So if somebody says, go build a log cabin in the woods, like you don't know what to do at first. You, you may sharpen the saw. You may look around for the right kinds of trees. You may just start whacking down the tree right away. So I think the goal is to like not invest too much that this is your one shot and you blew it, but giving yourself the space to like try, tinker, learn, keep growing, stay in the battle, stay in the field. Nothing has pushed you out that it's over for you as you absorb. And then you have these moments where you look back and you're like, yeah, I really like I, I, I did a fashion brand and, and I did like a, a logo redesign like right after we did our first logo you know I didn't really need to do that but I kind of wanted to and I redesigned my website five times and it was a lot of money and I wanted to you know because I wanted to work with designers so it's a it's a hard one because intuition is important 
but I think getting experience or borrowing the experience of others can be helpful in the mix to, to know what is fake work and what is real work. Yeah, so uh, I would just, if anybody else uh, would like to bring up any questions, I know we're a little bit over time, um, but also for Sarah, uh, for the canvas, um, specifically the Mentimeter. Yeah, I yeah. think Sarah, you're saying that the Mentimeter is, is not working. Did everyone just, can you see that link? Can you click on it and just like maybe quickly, I mean, I don't think this would take too long if you can just uh, put something in there and then see, Sarah, I don't think you've received anything yet, right? That's why you're not sure if it works. I'm gonna well, write. I, um, just write I saw things and then I didn't. And so I don't really trust my. Okay, let's, capacity. let's just try. Did, did anyone put, uh, Abir is about to put something in. I, I used it uh, in the beginning, the first link that was sent. And... Yeah, I did see something in there. Okay, so Abir just said test. Do you see it on your side? Um, yeah, I just, I'll have to, I mean, I'm sure if we put stuff in, it's in there. I just have to figure out how to now go in and get it. Okay. So... But uh, just to share a thought on the business uh, integral canvas, I, you're, you're inspired by business model canvas. Is that correct? Yeah, that's where um, that's where the idea is coming from. And there's lots of different ones, and I've seen them like feminist business models and uh, regenerative culture business model, like just different kinds of sustainable business models. And so it occurred to me, huh? I wonder what an an integral business model would have on it, or. Yeah. I, w I would say yeah, this this template is for the you know for moving forward for our incubator as well so that when participants come in they can look at a template like this and they can follow it along and see what they need what what they should be including yeah so. I think it's a very worthy uh, valuable project Sarah and and I think quite a deep one as well uh, right off the top of my head I would want to kind of look at the business model canvas and then just see like what of these are to be replaced. I think there should be some kind of ecological component, some kind of emotional component, and some kind of clear statement on like, why is this integral? And then some of the stuff to be conserved, I think is like the revenue and the expenses and uh, uh, you know, what is the value that you're providing? So it's exciting, you know, I, I'd love to sit with this a bit more and, and, uh, and see what, what I can I can share. Yeah. yeah. I wonder if we can get more people on, on Sutra and create a page for that so that they can just start including yeah, it yeah. there. Yeah. But were you going to say something? No, there are like, there's a couple of things that really popped out for me today. And like, one of them is this idea of integral shift. You said that I thought, hmm, what's an integral shift and how do you know? Kind of like in outcome mapping or um, you were talking like, how do I know that things are or integral in terms of the shift. And then there's this aspect of integral decision making. So there's decision making, and then what's integral decision making, and how is that different? And we're making decisions about marketing, about sales, about finance, about strategy, about uh, all of these things. And so, is there like is there something that's that's unique or slightly different for integral decision making? Like I'm also thinking of the criteria that Somia has for the for the pitch. Like how do we how do we look at something? And then the other piece was you mentioned a lot the integral change maker. And I'm thinking, like, what what is the integral change maker and how is that inside the the design of the the initiative? And the initiative doesn't or the project doesn't have to necessarily evoke. Well, I was thinking of Alex Gray's idea about art as systems change. And so he has an experience, uh, an I, I inner subjective, I ex first person experience. And then he goes to the, I'm using Wilbur's quadrants, like he goes to the upper, he has an experience in the upper left and then he, in the upper right, he, he makes this art. And then that art goes into society and gets uh, it gets seen and it, it's looked at and then it comes into the we space because musicians or other people are using it in their in their jacket design for their or it's going on t-shirts or whatever and so his 
experience of consciousness starts to create this this change of consciousness so it's like how art and i'm thinking like the same thing like how does whatever is created as a business which would be upper upper right how does that start to create momentum towards the paradigm shift that sonia was talking about like the integral paradigm shift yeah so yeah a couple of thoughts that came up i'm really curious about that yeah uh, the motivation and incentives and yeah I'd like to see guiding principles also like i would like a change maker to say these are my guiding principles these are non-negotiable yes. and right at the center because that's what informs the model and the this and the that you know yes um, yeah i think it'd be very cool to to see like what are the guiding principles yeah and that's very much a complexity mode of engaging is through is principle so rather than um, you know, actual outcomes that you have to see it looks like this but that's rather it's principle guiding anyways yeah. yeah so thanks so much for your presentation well, Lu luciana i think your hand is raised this is um this might sound really weird but i was actually thinking about this today and i realized that it has um it's very integral but kind of weird um and has played a big role in the way i um conduct my education at cis and that is with writing essays um i'm really taking into account the individuality of my professor as sort of um a reality that can be written to so it's like i'm i'm not only studying the material of the course but i'm also understanding that I, as a human being, am in relationship with another human being, and it's not coincidental. And how can I actually acknowledge the individuality that I'm writing to as sort of a part of my essay, as sort of a consciousness that informs my essay and their life? Like, why am I, as a student, um, significant to their teaching ship? So I'm just like thinking about these ways that integral can become really embedded in the fundamental fabrics of something as simple as a teacher student relationship and to me it really gets down to acknowledging individuality as a as the reality of the world steiner says that history is a history of individualities and it's because individualities kind of shape history um so for me like really seeing how each individual person is a karma, a biography, a capacity, a mission, all these sort of things. That to me opens up a whole new world really into the macrocosm and how that how these really cosmic relationships in, are embedded in in very intimate and and small structures of of community. Yeah, that's awesome. One of the little things I took away from PCC was the I thou relationship from rick and that sounds like a wonderful way to do that so that your teacher is not just this object for your needs but uh, i mean it's it's a very lunar I, I i sense a very lunar and even neptunian sensibility in that and, and i think it's it's great and um i'd be interested to explore with you how you balance you know absorbing their uh life with your own what is needing to be shared but it sounds like a very integrative exploration because it's not just you it's it's you and another as well yeah sometimes it's it's kind of um it's like i'll recognize in my individuality something that they're struggling with so i'll almost like emphasize that aspect of myself as a pressure almost to kind of give them an opportunity to see something that they don't like. And, and that in itself can be a sort of like um, beneficial moment for both of us because it can allow them to, um, to receive something that's sort of discomforting, but, but missing from their framework. And then in their response to me, it allows me to experience being received by someone that is struggling with me. And that's really um, beneficial for training myself how to navigate disparate relationships. 
And on the other hand, it can be really the opposite of like, oh, I see in this individuality that they um, they really get me. So I'm going to like really accentuate my my interest because I know it'll pour into their soul and and support something very deeply. And then it allows me to sort of experience myself as an educator as well as a student. So I think like finding ways to to expand our notions of our position. So we're not just in these constructs of student teacher or whatever, that there are forms above forms and evolutions above evolutions that we can actually compassionately engage in. And, and it it opens up a dialogue, especially in a PhD program that is much more inspiring and, and real world to me. Yeah, that's great. You know, many times people complain about how a certain space is not relational enough or the other person needs to be doing something else. But I, I appreciate the agency which you're bringing into these situations to say, maybe there is a hierarchy here, but I don't need to only live and, and see that. And I can also recontextualize this. And that's great. I just want to ask you, Luciana, if I can have coffee with you sometime. What you're describing there is something that I'm so curious about is how, like, what I hear in your description is like an intersubjective um, relational space and the and this notion of coherence and like coherence between two people. But what I'm really curious about is how do we create coherence between this many people like who are on our screen right now over time so that we become one and by becoming one we we tune in or we access a collective uh intelligence we access something that is much more than any one of us individually and like your ability to tune in and create coherence or to, to tune in on that interpersonal or the intersubjective of between two people. How does that expand? There's a place in uh, California somewhere. I listened to this podcast about how they're experimenting with that in uh, one organization or a team where they've really, really focused on creating that intersubjective coherence so that they can access the collective intelligence. Just a quick response to that is, I think Abir, Abir has been um, dialoguing around that by saying, by constantly bringing this word cosmos into his offering. I think like when a collective is under the, under the impression, under the umbrella that, they, that humanity is a cosmic work, it's not like, like the, the cosmos is actually benefiting from our social work because it is, is experiencing itself through us. Like those types of very overarching convictions for me help um, like orient an interest in the other, like actually developing true interest in individuality and experiencing that the person in front of you is a true portal into the spiritual world. It's a true, one is a true portal into a totally unique meaning and opportunity in life and, and finding ways to cultivate a sensitive interest in the other is I think the number one aspect, but it all kind of comes for me from this understanding that we, we are like a, a cosmic activity. It's not sort of an abstracted notion of humanity being some, I don't know, happenstance organism that that like kind of is just meaningless, but really that we are like really meaningful. Yeah, that's so important. Yeah, I mean, we, we you know, even human culture, technology, pollution, I mean, it is all from the same ground. It's not just this freak offshoot that we need to tear up, you know, like even McDonald's is part of the cosmic process and you know we maybe want to change it but that doesn't change the fact that it is part of not separate from yeah wow well well thank you abir that was really wonderful and um 
to Sarah Alexander and Lucien for holding it down while we were having a little bit of a technical issue. Thank you so much for that. And uh, Adriana and Rachel for, for being here and everyone else who was here and had to drop off. This was really, really wonderful. So take care. Thanks for sticking around for, for two hours. We'll uh, see you at the next event. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye.